Hello, everyone. I'm John Kasparian, Interim Dean of Architecture, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture. I would like to extend a special welcome to our alumni, parents, and families as this event kicks off the school's programming for the first ever combined Homecoming and Families Week virtual activities aptly entitled OWL Together. Other events this week include a virtual coffee session for families and parents with the Director of Undergraduate Studies, Professor Reto Geiser and I. This will take place tomorrow afternoon at 4.30. Please also join us for the first ever Platt Journal Roundtable on Wednesday at 6 p.m. and an RDA lunchtime lecture on Friday at noon by graduate students Sebastian Lopez and Lenny Sully whose affordable housing project won an honorable mention in the RDA's 2020 Houston Design Research Grant. And finally, at 4.30 p.m. on Friday, I will host a State of the School presentation, followed by Q&A and a first ever alumni mixer. Before we reintroduce today's speakers, I would like to thank them for graciously agreeing to return today for the second half of their lecture given at the begin beginning of September. So thank you so much. Also, again, special thanks to the committee who organized these lectures, which was chaired by assistant professors Sarah Nichols and Brittany Udding, and the staff members who are helping implement them, and especially Christine Worley. As usual, following the lecture, one of the student members of the committee will conduct a Q&A. And now I'd like to ask Professor Sarah Nichols to give the formal introduction to today's lecture. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. As, uh, on behalf of the lectures committee and co-chair Brittany Edding, I'd like to, to welcome you all to the second half of the lecture about paying attention by Ilse Wolf and Heinrich Wolf. This lecture is part of the fall semester series on race, social justice, and allyship, which is part of a school-wide initiative to address how architecture and the built environment have played a key role in the perpetuation of racial inequality and justice, while also projecting a, a positive future in which we aim to set an agenda for solidarity and action within architecture. So um, for those of you uh, joining today for the First time for Ilza and Heinrich Wolf's lecture. As, as John already explained, this is part two. So I would like to introduce our speakers today for those of you who are joining us uh, for the second half. Ilza Wolf is an architect, a scholar, and a writer who's the co director of Wolf Architects and the founder of the research, activism, and design organization Open House Architecture. OHA has hosted exhibitions, interventions, publications and talks with artists, activists, and scholars in order to foster public discussion on the city, space, and personhood. In 2017, Ilza received an international prize for scholarly works in modern and contemporary art and architecture in Rome for her book, Unstitching Rex True Form, which is the story of a garment factory in Cape Town and its afterlife. In 2018, she was shortlisted for the Architectural Review's Maura Gemmel Award and between 2017 and 2019, she was a fellow at the University of the Western Cape Center for Humanities Research. She also co-founded Pumflet, a publication for art and architecture, uh, some of which we saw in the previous uh, lecture. Heinrich Wolf is an architect, writer, and educator, and the other co-director of Wolf Architects. His research focuses on 20th century architecture in the third world, innovation in architecture at times of social change, and housing in South Africa. He's received awards, including the Daimler Chrysler Award for South African Architecture, the Lubeckin Award, and in 2011, he was elected as a designer of the future by the Wouter Mikmak Foundation. Heinrich has been a visiting professor at ETH Zurich, uh, IUAV in Venice and at WashU, and has been an adjunct associate professor at the University of Cape Town. He is author of Architecture at a Time of Social Change, published by the Teu Delft in 2012, which considers post-apartheid architecture in South Africa and the new role of the architect. Wolf Architects is a design studio concerned 
with developing an architectural practice of consequence through the mediums of design, advocacy, research, and documentation. The work of the practice has also been included at various international exhibitions, including in Venice, Shenzhen, at the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art, the Chicago Biennale, the Sao Paulo Biennale, and the South American Architecture Biennale. We are really pleased to have Ilza and Heinrich again here today. And again, this is because their work is both independently and together, provides a powerful vision of architectural practice as an agent for change, for addressing social inequity through scholarship and built work, documenting the erasure of indigenous landscapes and narratives. They also take pains to point out that their work is situated within a network of employees and collaborators as they already showed in part one of the lecture who represent and deploy diverse practices, including photography, art, film, and writing, expanding the notion of practice to encompass social justice advocacy, research and scholarship and conceptual art. So without further ado, Ilza and Heinrich, thank you so much for both joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much and greetings from Cape Town. Um, we are about to enter the evening here and I believe it is afternoon where most of you are from. So thank you very much. I also want to extend a thank you for, um, you know, creating this platform for a second time. Um, the kind of blessing of being part of partnership is that there's a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of shared interests and a lot of um, shared ideas. So thank you for agreeing to part two for this and we're thrilled to be here. So just to recap on what we um, spoke about last time is that essentially there were these two overarching ideas that become these kind of umbrellas for our architectural practice. And the one is um, found, we found some sustenance in the work of Fred Moten, who speaks about the idea of a critical analysis of anti-blackness in service of its violent eradication. And this is a direct quote from his book, um, Black and Blur, Black and Blur, Consent Not to Be a Single Being. We are also concerned within that ideas of Fred Moten around the kind of celebratory practices of, of blackness and how that can allow nourishment for some of the work that we do. The second idea that we spoke about and is directly in co correlation to the architectural projects that we showed was this idea of thinking about the infrastructure and how infrastructure is both a mechanism to, um, to, to divide as well as is a mechanism to connect. And we showed that in the mappings of the city and how um, you know the various parts of our city is, is kind of mapped around these infrastructural boundaries. The economy plays an integral role in how that infrastructure um, finds sustenance or finds manifestation. And we're interested in how the study of the econ economy, especially the macroeconomy, can begin to allow us to, to contemplate other con contemporary structures for the, urban, for the urban realm. We show that microeconomies is very important and how we can learn to develop um, architectural projects, for instance, in the watershed and, um, and, and, um, and other urban design ideas uh, in the market incubator. So this idea of paying attention comes from these various aspects, both cultural attention as well as our urban design ideas. The first project that I'd like to share um, before um, Heinrich um, takes us through, through some of the projects that we've looked at. Is this a project situated in my hometown called Stellenbosch? And um, it is essentially a farm in Stellenbosch, which is about 30 kilometers outside of our studio in Cape Town. Um, and to kind, of, to kind of explain it very crudely, um, it is a a group of farms that eventually conglomerated to produce a very big um, kind of uh, private landscape. We were approached about two years ago by the owner of this farm to develop a vision of a leisure and hospitality landscape. What you're seeing on the screen is the image of this place that sits mostly in the collective imagination of South Africans. 
as well as some of the tourists that visit South Africa. So you see a kind of cultivated landscape of grape production that we would eventually be used for the gold mine with a manor house right in the center and the backdrop of this incredible mountainous landscape. So we were asked to intervene in this landscape and to reimagine some of the existing buildings. What you see on the next screen is not often spoken about, and it is essentially the kind of labor that um, produces this landscape. So I'm a descendant of people that would have worked in this landscape to produce the kind of um, monoculture that would then begin to um, essentially um, uh, you know, become the, the, the capital for some of the owners. But what we wanted to share is that we wanted to not just dwell on the kind of um, labor practices and the, the enslavement of people. What we wanted to do is to, if we are asked to look at a new leisure landscape for this place, we wanted to think through what are the, the, the practices of black leisure within this landscape. So this photograph of a rugby team in the orchard became a pivotal way of reimagining a black leisure landscape for this place and finding other images that would then support that of families um, picnicking in, in and around the area as, as this one shows. Um, finding maps where people demarcated spaces for um, various sporting activities, rugby, cricket, tennis, and, and so forth. And also finding images and speaking to people around practices of leisure within a kind of a landscape that predominates around black labor essentially. These are one, this is one aspect of the research that we wanted to uncover for Bosch and Nile um, and try to tell a, a, a different story and predict a different future for a kind of a very loaded landscape. Um, the infrastructure in, in, in and around the farm was around a very um, cultivated landscape of um, dams and infrastructure, but we also found that people in the area made their own dams and swimming was a big part of how the landscape was populated by local people. The official history of the place is around these very important buildings, the manor house, the places where, for instance, Sir John Rhodes, um, who at one point was an owner, produced a, or asked the architect to, to design a building. But some of the lesser known buildings, um, like for instance on the left hand side of the screen, is a labor hostel, um, one of Cape Town's first labor hostels for um, the, the laborers at the time. And the official history of that place is completely just, um, you know, sort of not um, written out as much as some of the important buildings. And our focus was then to look at particularly those histories. Um, in conjunction with the, um, the other architecture. An image of this is a factory with on the, on the left a kind of a black settlement there and another black settlement which basically looks at this farm as a kind of a mono or a kind of a small analogy to the kind of separate development and um, apartheid landscape that we know as the South Africans where it plays out on a farm like Washington. And our focus in our sort of restoration, reparation work really focus more on the lesser known buildings, like for instance, this labor hostel for men and for, uh, to some degrees, their family later on. Um, this is a building that was called Tembaletu, which translates to New Hope. And our idea is to reimagine this building for the farm as an agricultural school for university. And our work is, is I did is essentially research work, but also to try and work with the municipality to um, uh, produce a conceptual framework that will really be the guideline for any future development for this site. That's another image of the ruins of this um, very interesting um, labor hostel. Um, I think that what we also want to speak about, about motives that uh, are connected to economic imperatives or, uh, as I would say in the past class, imperatives or 
labor imperatives and so on. And this hospital was a project where we explored the idea of equality in a way. Um, it sounds maybe very obvious to anybody coming from a very uh, equal society that equality is expressed in all architecture. But if you come from the most unequal society on earth, it is actually axiomatic that inequality is expressed. Um, and we were trying to think, well, what would this mean at the scale of a hospital and what would we do? So without going into all the details of the planning process, on the left, you can see the site as it was when we arrived there. And uh, on the right, you see the site as it was 13 years later as it is today. Um, so we did a phase two extension um, to uh, a new building. So this was a new building added in front of that. Um, and I really want to talk about the architecture of the roof, and the architecture of this plan, because we realized soon enough that one of the issues affecting the staff of our hospital is how compact the plan is. And a very compact plan doesn't always make for very sexy architecture because it gets very, very congested. Um, and it has huge consequence on throttling daylight. And we were trying to say, well, is there a possibility that this building could be awash with daylight, um, but also is that it can express uh, egalitarianism, uh, constitutionality. Because remember, a hospital is a place where you have people get paid very little and people get paid a great deal uh, working in the same place. And just try and know, like you do with an airport, have one roof that in a way goes across all spaces. Um, and what we came up with was this device that we really, it's a thing that we really learned from shopping malls. You know, shopping malls really have the superstructure of a roof, which is really autonomous, that floats over the plan and allows infinite changes of the plan over time. So you can see a, a series of stubs, which would be a series of concrete columns. But besides for the floor and this roof, that in a way constitutes the superstructure. Um, but that this is made in a series of bays, um, the size of a typical ward. And then we have rationalized the services in such a way to be able to allow natural light in between it. Um, here you can see the main service highway going through the building, but significantly it doesn't go above the corridor, which is one of the conventions of hospital design. It goes right next to the corridor so that we can have daylight in the corridors. So if you look at this day diagram, you can see how we basically designed a roof light in a place where it can go up to 40 degrees centigrade and so on um, to separate light and heat. Um, and the logic is that you have staff members who sit in a race course plan. You know, a race course plan is a plan where you have the boards on the two sides. You very often have the services in the middle, but very often the people who work for um, career for the province or the client uh, would sit in the middle of the plan space devoid of natural light. It's a difficult thing to get right. So the idea was to design a system like this, that's like a triple glaze system, that when the summer light comes in, you catch the heat here and you uh, strip it out. And when the winter sun comes in more obtuse angle, then it can come through and warm the interior. So it makes an undulating ceiling, you know, that breaks with the convention of these big horizontal ceilings, which is, uh, uh, makes for very institutionalized spaces. But the idea is this idea of providing dignity to all staff members equally, you know, from the surgeon to an admin staff to a patient and so on. And that these are wonderfully sunlit spaces, but also is that the staff that would sit one room behind us would have a series of glass windows where they can look through this and see the garden that would be visible through these windows at the back. So, uh, these are the corridors. This is what it looked like just uh, as we were opening it. Um, and you can see that you can switch off the lights 80 to 90% of the time inside this building, but it allows a compact plan. So it doesn't have a series of courtyards that string up the walking distances and really exhaust the nursing staff. Um, so it achieves a, a very dense, um, fully filled plan without courtyards, but bringing the light in from above. And then the idea is to have this roof system 
equivalently for all people. So it's in the corridor, it's in the wards, this is the kitchen, and this kitchen's also designed that it has a window on the side, you can just see the light reflecting there, but a great uh, amount of design effort and persuasion went into uh, talking about how to arrange this kitchen so that the staff that work there not only have natural daylight uh, every day, but have a window where you have a 150 kilometer view over the mountains and there's uh, dignity to all spaces that's equivalent. Um, these are the woods. Um, this is the central waiting space um, and you can see the, the design of the daylight here has more of a function on things like circulation here or the cafeteria selling food there, etc. Um, that's the exterior. I'm not going to go on about this too much. Um, the other one, you know, in uh, trying to pay attention is that this is a school where there's a very particular sensitivity that's called uh, that the architect is called to bring to the uh, typology. So this is a school for children on the autism spectrum, spectrum and with severe learning disabilities. Um, and this is also a school for provincial government. Um, and it is a project that tries to work out how do you build this institution in the 21st century and what is the right way of doing it? Um, and considering this um, uh, exploration of the idea of a superstructure that really serve everybody and a substructure that is maybe of less consequence. And um, we came up with a very, very basic plan because it's an uh, inexpensive building and we tried to spend the money where it really mattered. And the, what we tried to do is that the main structure of the architecture is a social structure. And that really would be these courtyards that's formed between banks of classrooms. There's these classrooms face to the inside um, and they make secure courtyards. There are gates that lock these courtyards uh, because some of the kids are prone to running around and then the teachers have to uh, find them. And you don't want that process to be a process that involves drama and violence and you know the strongest, fastest man to run down you know, a 10-year-old girl, uh, which is a kind of thing that could happen in a space like this. So we tried to find the social structure. Um, you can see here, yeah, there's a park across the way and we made this big courtyard, this facing out onto this park. And then there's a sports field on the lower area and that overlooks uh, towards the mountains and you have this incredible view in the distance. Um, but what we came up with was uh, very basic structure of classrooms facing inward into this A-frame structure. Um, and the A-frame structure has real advantage that comes out of long discussions with the staff and the parents and so on. It's, what is wonderful about the school is how involved the parents and the staff are in the lives of their children, because for the school to take care of their kids, of course, of huge importance um, to the parents. Um, and we found is that what happens in this kind of uh, education is that very often the classroom replicates aspects of home. So in other words, you teach younger children toilet training, you teach them to brush their teeth, to eat with a knife and a fork, to wash their dishes, etc. You teach older kids to um, iron clothes and so on, to be self-sufficient in a house. And then you try as much as you can to advance their athletic abilities, their sociability, their economic activities, etc. cetera. Um, and in the schools that we studied, we found that uh, the, the typologies were very much centered around classroom and the classroom education, but we did not find the architectural corollary of the public domain. And these A-frame spaces really tries to become this kind of public domain. We can do sport, you can do art, you can see their teachers helping somebody with physical exercise, the residues of some art class. We have some scenes where they're running up and down, yeah, and so on. And the, there's a sort of climatic health logic to some of this, and that these kids are very prone to catching respiratory disease. And we live in a place where um, we have strong winds. Um, and we started off by making a very basic courtyard architecture and the 
the staff and the parents were saying they're really worried, you know, the kid's going to get sick. It's not enclosed enough. So we came up with this very basic roof that then is open on the two sides. You know, so what you're seeing is the next um, unit. Um, and you see it's open on two sides and it can ventilate on the sides and it can ventilate on the top. But if the wind is blowing, um, it mitigates the wind. There's sunlight coming through this polycarbonate and there's some acoustic panels here that the space doesn't get noisy. But it's a very basic rudimentary paved surface in a way that becomes the social space. And then from the sports field, you can see the social space that's being expressed here. Um, uh, and then you see the hall and the workshops located in the middle of the plan. Here you can see looking from a smaller courtyard in the administration building that doesn't need a roof to the roofed areas of the classrooms. And here you can see being inside the classrooms and then looking out at the court and you can see how this becomes a sort of a social threshold as well. We can lock the door uh, if you need to, sorry, um, but still have a social connection to what is going on uh, on the inside. Um, um, the, um, many of these kids are very sensitive to stimulation of very sort, various sorts. So the acoustics are very carefully designed and the daylight is very carefully designed because uh, many of the kids are very sensitive to glare. So in trying to make a school hall, we try to make a space where there's just zero glare. And the idea is to get south light, you know, now in the southern hemisphere, of course, it's the same as north light in the northern hemisphere. Um, and just these very gentle uh, washes of light that go over the surfaces, that there's no dramatic distribution of light. And here you can see is what the space is looking like. You can see the, the acoustic paneling that's in here, behind here, behind there, behind there. And then uh, you can see a much simpler treatment of the wall with natural daylight coming through there. Um, and then some markings on the floor that help the school to set out the hall in a non-hierarchical circular manner rather than in a linear fashion. Um, one of the issues of course is dropping off kids with all sorts of uh, difficulties, walking difficulties, uh, intellectual difficulties and so on. And the idea is that, you know, uh, we have the drivers on the right hand side of the road. You always drop kids there on the circular route. And there's a series of benches here that you can stop kids can come out underneath the roof and go into the classrooms because they are then accompanied by their parents. Uh, here you can see it's uh, a nice uh, bus, bustling space in the afternoon when it's pickup time, but you can see that always the driver's seat is facing the kids are waiting. So they would say, uh, they would tell the kids to come and wait here on the bench and wait for parent to arrive. And this is what it looks like when it's quiet. Um, and then the last project that I uh, want to uh, discuss is a project that we won in an international uh, competition. A whole lot of African architects were invited to participate for a national house of worship for the Baha'i of the DRC. And that is for this house of worship to be built in Kinshasa. Um, so this is an extraordinary site. Uh, I don't know how familiar um, any of you are with the demands on the design of a Baha'i temple, but I can just go through it. It's very often, almost always, these national temples are located in big important gardens. Um, and in this case, there's something about working out what kind of a garden would be appropriate um, for uh, a temple such as this. So what you're seeing here is a plateau and then a very, very fertile valley. So what happens, it's very sandy soil, water is falling down onto sort of rock surface, it gets transported it, uh, out onto this fertile valley and you have this very beautiful valley going down to the Congo River there in the background. So these are images of this fertile valley and you can see palm trees, date trees, pawpaw trees, sweet potato patches, all sorts of productive landscape that is made there. And for us, this humanized nature is an extraordinary one that sits, uh, coexists with this very beautiful natural environment. So in the site plan, this is the valley, and you can see how the system continues here. There's a whole lot of people settling on the land here, and we hope that this boundary in a way will protect what is really 
the beginning of the system, because if it's built over enough, um, it disappears, unfortunately. Um, so the idea is that this wonderful humanized productive landscape, which is a space of labor, um, can be part of the temple because uh, by a very strong conviction about the idea that labor is a kind of a devotion to your fellow uh, human beings and to God, um, and that labor in that sense is a very important part of life. Um, so there is this space of devotional labor in a way here, yeah? and then there's this image of the idealized nine-sided star. So all by temples have to be nine-sided, um, quite simply because the Baha'i is um, are very committed to the idea of equality. Uh, all temples in the history of the Baha'i faith over the past 150 years or so have expressed this idea. So the requirement is for a building that has nine absolutely identical sides, um, a non-nagonal plan in essence with nine openings with no differentiation between any of the openings so absolute equivalence representing equality now when we did the hospital we had this roof going over the entire um, uh, hospital plan that also tries to express this quality of staff members that you know as human beings there's a constitutional equality that doesn't necessarily reflect your income grade but that the building treats you equivalently and it was a very nice foray for us into doing a project like this that takes equality between a rural person and an urban person, an uh, African person and an Asian person, uh, uh, a poor person and a wealthy person, et cetera, et cetera, um, to try and, uh, to give an equivalence to that. But I must admit there's so much of contemporary architecture relies on this idea of disruption. So you set up some order and you disrupt it and to make peace with the idea that there's a client that's looking for a very calm and calm equivalence. We were again looking at other building types that does that. And we were thinking of something like a sports stadium. You know, if you think of fire escape from a sports stadium, there's something absolutely equivalent about how you might have 20 seats in a row and then a passage of a given width, et cetera, to evacuate people. And it results in a bowl of a very, very fixed nature. And very often you find that the bowls of sports stadiums designed by engineers, simply because there's such a fixed logic. Um, but yeah, we are trying to find a religious corollary and a cultural corollary that could shape um, this building. So at the top, you see the oldest uh, Baha'i temple that was ever built in Ishkabat, in uh, what I think is the south of Russia today. Um, it got destroyed through an earthquake and a fire. Um, but you can see there already is absolutely equivalent openings, uh, nine openings. And then you see the second oldest temple, which is the temple at Wilmet in Chicago. Um, some of you may know this. Um, that is a very beautiful lattice structure and has the images of Christianity, Judaism, um, Hinduism, and, and other faiths marked on the building as a way of declaring an openness to all of humanity. Um, so we studied all the temples, the national and international temples, the continental temples that were ever built because it's 150 year history, we could study them all. And we developed a document in a way to begin to talk to the client as to how we're reading the entire history of Baha'i architecture. Then what we started looking as we started looking at what do we know about Kinshasa? and both contemporary Kinshasa and historic Kinshasa. And one of the most inspiring images that we found was this image on the left of a dome structure. Uh, it's a series of houses uh, with roofs, looks like uh, palm leaves, that makes this domed edge over a very carefully crafted wall that looks like a bamboo to us. Um, in amongst these gigantic baobab trees. Now, um, there's almost nothing of this left today. Um, the baobab trees were systematically dynamited by the Belgians. Uh, they saw it fit as an infrastructural intervention to dynamite thousand-year-old trees, to clear the way for roads, because there was a fairly dense settlement of these kinds of houses, and they found that if they bombed the trees, then they make a roadway. 
So they famous lanes of baobabs, where their names still exist, but the baobabs don't. A very, very tragic and brutal history. Um, and for anyone who knows that history, if you think that's brutal, you must see what they did to people. I would not like to repeat it, it's disgusting. Um, then what we tried to do is to begin to understand uh, what is there in the lives uh, of cultural practitioners of all sorts, not just architects um, or people building houses that we could learn from. Um, and in the spirit of celebrating black lives, what would there be that was achieved um, and is still inherent in that society, that's living traditions, that is open for us to participate in. And that's a very difficult one because we, of course, outsiders who um, won a competition. Um, but we were very inspired by the textile um, making and many aspects of the textile making. So on the very right, you see a flattened image of a shoe of cloth a very, very beautiful thing. I keep on staring at this cloth and I always think that these are some of the most extraordinary things that's made in the 20th century. And, you know, you look back at Mondrian's art and it's as dull as chips in a way, um, where these things are, have a life to them. And we've been trying to analyze what's the origin of this liveliness and syncopatedness and so on. So the first thing that you find in the literature, literature is people are saying, don't be mistaken by this flattened out piece of cloth that you find in some museum in Paris, because that's never how it was intended to be used. It was intended to be wrapped around a body and ideally in the situation of dance and movement. Um, and you can see that image here on the woman and you can see this sort of undulated edge that is made um, to the cloth. One of the other things that we started being fascinated by are marks like this and marks like that. So what happens in the making process is that the surface uh, is stomped um, and made soft. And sometimes that bruises the surface. So you have a brand new thing that then has a hole in it. But there's a tradition of repair that is absolutely endemic to working with an object like this. So whether it is during the design process or the making process originally, or later in uh, its use that it gets a hole in it, you can repair a patch. And that patch is absolutely incongruent with the cloth. Um, then we started looking at other aspects of uh, this textile. And we started looking for reciprocities between uh, DRC textile tradition and um, the by faith principles. Now, in the Baha'i faith, there is an idea that all buildings are made collaboratively. And I can tell you this project is very much designed between the architects, the engineers, the client, collaboratively. We meet with the client and the builder once a week since the uh, sketch design process uh, in order to advance the design and make sure that all parties are in agreement uh, about its design. So all level of author authoritarianism in the role of the architect is removed and the genius author uh, is dissolved in a way. We spoke a lot last time about this problem that we have with the genius author. Now, one of the things that we've learned in this uh, Kuba cloth is if you look at this cloth here, there's some quite remarkable things. So the backing that's folded over sort of reddish, and that is made by men. That is a raffia a mat that is basically woven that is pre-prepared and that then receives a second layer of uh, woven cloth that's made by women. So this piece here is not made by one woman, but by four. So if you look very carefully, you can see there's a joint there and there's a joint there. So what happens is people endeavor to collaborate with a similar tradition without similarity. And this is absolutely remarkable. You know, one is to have collaborative artworks of this nature that where everybody understands their roles. And in the research we've done is we've learned that, you know, uh, young girls from very, very young age are taught the games of these sort of zigzag patterns uh, to be able to make these things that you can sit by yourself, you make your pattern. And when somebody is stitching it, they stitching it sort of together. You see, this is right, this is right, this is right. This is missing it completely. This is missing it. 
they it sort of continues they it sort of continues and they the the pattern is lightened you know to make an integration so there's this weaving process so in one like this for instance i mean i don't know the history of this object in terms of its makers so for instance was this thing joined here with really remarkable people making these squares in between uh, that made a seam between four different components it's not quite clear and the beauty of this collaborative process is one that has inspired us immensely and then lastly one of the things that's also inspired us is that this is not just a tradition that is perpetual because one of the books that came out that I must admit has annoyed us substantially is a book by uh, a Swiss architect called uh, Valerio Olgiati who uh, 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 wrote on the non-referential, basically saying the referential is impossible. And in the context of a multicultural world, it's an impossible project can never be achieved. Um, but it sounds a bit like Adolf Lewis saying it's only the savage who tattoo himself and um, you know, decoration is a sin. It, yeah, it has rings for us of those statements. I and mean, also is this idea that in a place like the DRC, with this uh, long and violent history of Europeans uh, systematically removing uh, the cultural goods of Africa by um, uh, physically destroying it, uh, bombing it, uh, moving it to museums in Paris, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, has left a very difficult relationship with that uh, cultural legacy, and one where you can't just easily say, "Well, we can't make reference." So this one is an extraordinary story of an unfortunately an unnamed Kuba king who in the 1930s um, uh, began his reign. At the beginning of Kuba king's reign, um, they can choose the motive that will be on the ceremonial staff and on ceremonial uh, textiles that would be for the duration of their reign. So the Belgians came and gave a motorbike to this king. And he wasn't very really taken with the motorbike, but he was immensely taken by the tire tracks that it made and the pattern that it made. And he got somebody to make a drawing, which is what you see there on the left, which is a distilling of the tire track that he saw. And then he decided this pattern will be the motive of uh, his kingship. And the pattern on the right is textile that um, date from his kingship. And this wonderful um, openness to Possibility, new possibilities of the future, of course, means that you know it's open to interpretation and reinterpretation. Um, and then to conclude this discussion is that we try to then say that we cannot burden a temple like this with too many metaphors. You see all these amazing things. You're absolutely gobsmacked. I must admit, I knew only about very little of it. Some of it through Sammy Bologi and the stuff that you see there on the top left. Um, but we were thinking of images um, that's evoked in Baha'i text. And there is a Baha'i text that talks about the quality of people and the way in which God's grace rains down equally on all people. And this idea that uh, all people are like the waves of the same ocean, the droplets of the same river, the flowers of the same garden. And we were looking at how can we find a metaphor that sits between all of these things and the undulation and the pleating that we find in uh, this kind of dress. You know, on the left, you find um, another unnamed Kuba king, unfortunately, um, and the uh, dress that was made, but you see this pleating that happened and um, some elder men that you see on the side there, same kind of pleating in the dress. Um, and this kind of pleating and um, uh, reference to uh, the wave and images of water and cloth we try to perpetuate. Now we're busy in the process of that and I'm not going to show you anything that has not been shown and agreed to by the client. But to just show you the ground floor plan in a very basic way, you'll see a absolutely non-agonal plan. Um, it has no speaker in the front, it has no priest, it has all the Devotional readings and song come from the congregation themselves. Sometimes the choir would stand on the gallery, sometimes it would stand around the temple, but that is uh, how it would work. Um, and you can see what it is, is one single room. All by temples in the world is one single room. And you find that that periphery sits there. Uh, there's a, a certain ambulatory, 
right around it that makes the boundary between the temple and the garden space. You see here, this is an undulating roof, a lower canopy here and a rainwater collection point. But what happens is that this is one gigantic space with not one column, not one support. Um, I'll show you in section how we are doing that. But it means that the periphery here and the center in essence is the same space. Um, and it enters into a, a conversation in a way with the legacy of uh, religious buildings that has a periphery in the center, like the Baha'i uh, temples that's made like that, or Unity Temple that Frank Lloyd Wright did, or other such structures. This is the first floor plan, and you can see how the stairs go up, and the stairs support a massive compression ring that supports the dome. And uh, above, there's a crown of light that comes down onto the center. So this you can see is the, the structure. And what you have is you have a series of stairs. So there's a seated platform here that always faces inwards. So you don't want anything to turn its back to the, the interior. And these are seats where people can sit right around the periphery of the temple and look inside. And then these stairs then become the support of this ring. But, you know, I stand to be corrected. I don't know many domes in the world where the forces are not taken straight down you know, um, where the forces are taken at an oblique angle. You know, usually it's taken down like this or at an angle like this, but to remove the support here, I don't know another dome like that in the world. And then there's a big lantern. There are openings around the edge here, and there's natural light coming then in through this crown opening here. And you see these undulated edges, you know, so the roof goes up and down on the lower canopy and on the upper canopy. And you can see the interior is a very, very calm space um, that has this periphery here. You can see these seats, a very simple stair going up. People can sit on the edge, can go up into a gallery. Many of the national Baha'i temples have a gallery where you can sit and face inwards of the temple and you can have a choir there. Um, and then this equivalent set of openings. And we really try to give a light to this temple that is unique to Baha'i light. You know, so in other words, it's not Islamic in its nature, it's not Christian in its nature, it's not Hindu in its nature. We try to find a kind of Baha'i light that is something where the, the sources are never seen, there's not very high contrast of light and so on. Um, this is the view from the gallery where you are sitting. There's a cork wall behind you, you know, back here, it helps with the acoustics. And then you're seeing back into the temple like that. And that is the crown where the light is coming through and all uh, Baha'i temples have the name of God or as they call it, the greatest name, right in the center as a window um, that is then framed by a nine-sided star. Um, and this is some of the work that we're doing on the outside. I'm not going to focus on the outside because we don't think it's entirely there. But this is built with uh, concrete block and built in a, you know, in a way in which as much of the technology can be used that is to be found in the DRC. Um, and you can see we're making these graphics in a way we can begin to see where we test the quality of the appearance of elements. And we can see how the garden layer sits with a concrete layer, sits with a concrete block layer and with the roof. So we've been making a series of those. And this is drawings that by now is almost four months old. We have um, some new ones that you will see us launch for in a month or two months time with a very different kind of an artwork um, that we're working on. Um, but this is the valley, um, the view from the valley as you would see the temple right there on the periphery of the valley. But the idea is to make kind of an artwork that people will associate with the DRC, the achievements of the DRC, the greatness of that society, rather than some abstractness that talks about building construction, uh, talks about circulation and uh, uh, rooms and light only, like uh, Ogliati would uh, suggest. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that and we open the floor for some questions. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. Um, so now we're moving into the Q&A session. Um, first question is from me. Uh, in the lecture, 
you mentioned the idea of equality in architecture a lot of time. So I wonder if you can further elaborate in your work, how many autonomy is given to the user that the architecture is designed for? Is there an intention between equality of architects and people who use the architecture? And how can we achieve that? Yeah, the, the, the thing is that in South Africa, um, whether these are public hospitals or schools, or whether you're talking about a religious building, or you know, we're busy with a, a small building in France for some puppeteers, which is a very specific project. Um, the, the most rewarding part is the discussion out of which this project is born. And the reason why is we do not believe in this idea of the genius author. In other words, that you have this great visionary who will tell everybody how it's to be done. And if only they can keep quiet and listen, then it will be better. Um, now, we do not try and abdicate the role of the author, that we're not trying to do either. The author and authorship has a very important role. But there's something about that authorship being a shared experience. Um, and you're having a sense of whether people are enjoying the motives that are out there. So, um, you know, for instance, you come up with a design of some mural or something, and you might find is that the first reaction is a negative one. The client doesn't like it. And very often with a mural, it's very hard. It's ugly and beautiful. When you talk about how steel connections to be made, nobody argues. But when it's a mural thing or a color on a wall and so on, people have a lot of opinions sometimes. Um, but there's something in that um, if there is a wonderful discussion and a process through which um, all uh, tiers of user um, participate in uh, the uh, coming about of this project, um, the better it is. You know, maybe Ilza should speak. I mean, we spoke briefly about the yeah. project that we did for the University of Western Cape, which is a public university, but Ilza can tell us yes. what was done there. Yes, I mean, before I get to that, I think there's also a great deal of um, developing the skill of listening, you know? So we, we, we listen, we listen to the people who would be intending to use the building, we listen to how the environment um, would, you know, receive the intervention. And also there's a way of looking at the information or the kind of, um, you know, research that we find in alternative ways, you know. So the work that we did, for instance, in Toshinal, um, and the kind of, you know, I mean, the only way I can really describe it is in, in the kind of the way that I think Americans might understand it, is essentially a, a plantation, you know, where enslaved people work. And there's been a series of erasure and a series of erased histories um, that we can either choose to participate in or begin to reveal. And through that reveal, um, you know, formulate other visions for the space. And it is about how does one listen, not just to the, the, the brief or the kind of people that are asking you these questions or asking you um, to make the intervention, but how do you listen to the archive? I mean, what, what, what are the silences in the archive? And it's a thing through, you know, and how do we, how do we get to interpret that? So it is not just a kind of a, a, a exercise in a contemporary, way of um, dealing with the, the current people that are going to be using it. But it's a kind of a restorative work of the past as well, and people that were not necessarily listened to, you know, that we get to incorporate, we're trying to incorporate as part of the story. Yeah, we did a submission for the Sao Paulo Architectural Year Biennial um, that dealt with the idea of the everyday. And what we were proposing is that the everyday is not this homogenous solid uh, mass, but it's rather a bit like Swiss cheese that has voids in it. And it's for us in a way to understand uh, the, the process of removal of the substance that maybe was in that void, or the processes of blinding that from view, um, and bringing that back to the present in a way to yield um, a sense of the contemporary city, a sense of history, etc. Thank you so much. Um, question from Will Sun. He asked, Following the last question, in the process of seeking equality in architecture and breaking with norms, we must suspect that you've seen quite a lot of resistance. What are some of the ways people resisted and how were you able to convince them? Yeah, so the thing is in the, in the context of the Baha'i Temple, 
you have a client that demands it. Um, it's a non-negotiable, it's wonderful. We, we don't have to have a discussion about it. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. So it's a very easy, wonderful project to test that idea of equality between people and what does a space like that mean for, as a space of worship in equality rather than a in equality. But, um, you know, the, the habit of inequality is a, a habit of architects and urban designers. And if you think of the studies that we showed uh, that looked at infrastructure and those mappings that we showed in the previous lecture, um, there's something about, I think the United States is very similar to South Africa, in that structural racism and structural inequality is very much aided by architects and urban planners. Uh, the attitude of predatorial capitalists cannot find um, currency in our society if it's not substantially aided by spatial practitioners. Um, so the mall is one of my classic pet hates, you know, that my thesis at university on how to destroy the typology of a shopping mall. And it's part of what we did at the watershed project we spoke about last week. But um, uh, oh, um, this, this idea of how do we, um, you know, what are the strategies of going against some of the resistance to these ideas, yes. I mean, what, we, what we're sharing today and the way we're sharing it is within a kind of educational environment as in lectures and you know, sharing of ideas and possibly offering future students and future practitioners some of the strategies that we've used in the projects. But a lot of the time we don't speak to the people about these specific strategies. You know, it's something that we discover along the way. And, you know, sometimes it's not essentially the key part of the discussion. The discussion is always very simple, like for instance with an incubator, we just wanted to make a kind of a, uh, a connection, you know, between, uh, you know, between the new building and the main mall. That is the kind of the level of discussion that carries on with us and the clients and the, 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 the users. We don't necessarily tell them, you know, this idea of microeconomy and, you know, came from a previous study because it's not, it's not really, you know, it's not useful for that platform, you know, um, you know how, how it finds manifestation is more useful for the people that are going to be using it. So there's various ways of communicating, um, you know, if we say too much, then the resistance will come too early. You know, yes. so, so it's it's almost like a um, an act of subversion and, and you know kind of underground um, work while the project is is in play. So yeah, I think one of the other uh, strategies that we developed is the one of simultaneity. You can fulfill a brief. You can have all the square meterage. You can make the income per square meter that your client is demanding. Yeah. Um, and then because you tick all the boxes that they are looking at they are blind to an alternative spatial logic. This idea that an architect could fulfill the entire brief and another one that is of your own making and your own politics that has to do with say, you know, in the case of the watershed is studying the city that's made by the most vulnerable citizens in the context of survival and in the context of very aggressive economic forces. So we study how they occupy a space, how big it is, what's the formation, what's the logic. Then we apply it to a building that it has no link to, um, but it still made money for the client. So they have no objection because it fulfills their criteria, but the simultaneity of an alternative politics then is achieved uh, unnoticed. Thank you. Um, the third question, uh, the color being used in your work is very intriguing. Uh, in the school and also in the temple, there are different shades of yellow at the facade and inside and the green on the facade of the temple and also the fade blue you show in the previous project. So can you talk more about that? Yeah, that's, uh, it's a long story. So the Elson School is an interesting one because it has almost no color, the, the, the Sherry Water School. And that was a very <laughs> painful discussion for us because we love colorful buildings. And then we were very close to starting to paint the building. And then uh, one of the teachers saw the diagrams of the painting and she said, no way, you cannot do this. You cannot have light text on a dark background. The kids have real difficulty reading it in signage. And we had the lower area, a darker color. 
and they said you cannot paint a building white because it's too glary it must be a cream color everything must be cream and this came very late in the process nobody mentioned this and we had to comply and there was another school where the architect actually painted it all sorts of colors and then we were forced to repaint it all in very muted color so that's an exception but there is something about the legacy of european white buildings and Adolf Lewis's statement about, you know, only the savage will tattoo his body and decoration is a sin. That is a very, very heavy burden on European architecture. And this white, unadorned architecture has a very racist history. Because Gottfried Semper thought it was really cool the way Maoris tattooed their faces and then had the same pattern on cloth and on buildings. And the same with Greek temples. And he found a common language in peoples of the world, although it was from a colonial gaze. Um, and there's something about uh, how we use color, and we use the color yellow very often because we bounce light around in buildings. And we have found that if you bounce around light in buildings in very sunny climates, very often the light cools down and gets very blue. So we very often have yellow elements inside roof lights or below roof lights or clear story windows and so on as a way of keeping the light warm and not a sense of a sort of a grimness that you can find in a sort of a gothic cathedral to made all of stone and light bouncing around. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture and thank you for answering all these questions. It's amazing project yeah. to see. Cool. It's a pleasure to have the second discussion with yes. all of you. There's a running joke in the office that you know, in the end it will be yellow. But Heineken and I are we deny it. We deny it. Great, thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to um, to hear the rest of your um, present presentation, and 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 I think it really did require the two sessions in order to understand the un unbelievable multitude of of your work. Um, so thank you so much again for for joining us for this second half. Um, since we have a little bit of time, I have maybe just one more question, if you don't mind, before hanging up, which is just, um, I'm wondering if it is refusal in your palette of um, actions as well. I, I imagine that with your approach, you, you have to say no quite often to prospective clients. We, we do. Yeah. It's very painful. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we demand that people do better, you know, you know, that we just ask, can we, can we collectively do better? You know, um, can we, as, as, because the thing is, it's again, you know, that architect, the architectural practice um, in, is in collaboration with the people that are going to be providing the financial resources and then in collaboration with the people that are going to be ultimately using the space. So there needs to be a kind of collective ethics, which is, difficult almost to establish in the beginning, you know, and a lot of the work prior to the design work is to kind of not only develop the ethics, but then convince the rest of everybody around us about that collective ethic. We managed to kind of get it um, right with the Boshendal project in terms of the, you know, developing a framework for how to intervene, you know, and it's, it's a very strange project because we ultimately did no architectural interventions but the, much of the work has gone into developing the ethic and getting everybody's buy-in. So whoever then you know, participates in making architectural spatial interventions will need to kind of you know, participate in extending that ethic, which is a ethics around anti-racism and you know, restorative justice and um, you know, uh, kind of a kind of, you know, not a, not a kind of a hyper-capitalist development framework. That was the ethic. It took us a while to find the specificity of that ethic within that framework because it's also our studio ethic. So then how do we then have our specific located work in that? And that, that's for us, it's, it's very architectural work, but it doesn't always manifest in a project. Yes, and also as part of having a collaborative process is that you can just say it's not working. Yeah. It's like any relationship. Yeah. It's, and also, the thing is that if you try and advance um, uh, an agenda, uh, sometimes it just doesn't sit well with people. So after a year, they realize, but you're not backing off from this. 
And, you know, uh, we always say that we are professional, we are not obedient. So in other words, like a doctor doesn't tell you what you would like to hear. They tell you what they see and what they know. And we do the same. And sometimes that's uncomfortable for people and they would like to back out of it. They're saying, you know, you two are just too crazy. You know, this is just too much. Can we get out of it? So it has happened sometimes that clients try to fire us or fire us. Um, but there's something about getting fired in good time. You know, and not in a rude way. It's like... You know, you'll say my metaphors, but it's like going on a date. You know, you meeting somebody, and then at a certain point you say, great, but this is not for me. I want to move along. Um, and I think that one must, mustn't be too shy about it, because then the collaborative process doesn't mean that anything goes, and you compromise just to stay on the ride. Uh, it is not the case. So, you know, something like the watershed, it was a famous process. It's the first submission of the design. There were two people in the room, the one desperately wanted to fire us. And that person within the first minute was red-faced, brutally angry at us. We changed the brief and we changed the site, which comes as a bit of a surprise. They asked us to think outside the box and then you do it. And sometimes that leap is just too much. Um, but they hung in there and they, uh, they listened and they did it. And it's an extraordinary project because of that, uh, because the uh, they did not fire us, and the conversation continued. So it's a hugely successful project commercially and socially. Yeah, also, we don't always have the luxury to refuse, you know, right at the beginning. We always say, let's, let's have a look. Let's have yeah. a look, you know, and what's the story? <clears throat> it comes to trouble or to you know, charge, then, you know, we, we sort of said, we had a look, and this is not our thing. Um, yeah, you're on your own. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I said that would be the last question, but maybe the complement of that would also be through your research activities, you initiate so many projects uh, that take different forms, exhibitions, um, uh, publications. And do you ever have the idea that 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 your research activity would also lead to 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 generating projects or is or is kind of the scale of capital for so so unimaginable that you would maybe rather than you taking on the lead finding actually creating the client in order to to see any of these projects through is that sorry it's a bit vague but is that somehow also in the realm of thinking exactly what you do is you know we organize a lot of exhibitions at our office about issues that concern us that we are either directly the authors of or some photographic collective or somebody else, the authors of. And what is very nice about that is that you can put out an idea without you being the author. You know, so it's the same as the research that I did in the noon on the structures that people build for themselves. So you can come to unbelievably radical conclusions, but they're not mine. And people feel far less intimidated by those ideas. If I claim they're mine and I go and I stomp my fist on the table, insisting that this is the way forward to the city, people turn stone cold. If I say, well, it's not my idea, you know, I saw this person doing it, I think it's remarkable. Look, other people were doing it. This is a trajectory of ideas. And you can put it out there, and then what happens is some random person comes to an exhibition, they see what you're doing, and then they say, but no, we, we have a housing project. We want you to um, uh, apply that ethic, and we've gotten university buildings like that, housing projects like that, and so on, very much to the exhibitions that we do, because we, we, what's the expression? We put our colors to the mast. And then you don't have to go and in the project, begin to surprise everybody. They know you as holding that position and defending a certain position. Um, uh, and that opens the door then to radical agendas um, that is not necessarily your own and where the dominance of the author does not uh, have an intimidating power. In some ways, this in and of itself is could be considered a, a radical call for architects to, um, you know, branch out and 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 understand that that in order to um, to make major change, you need to be um, you need to be building solidarity with people outside of the profession. It's not just talking about architects; it's about learning how to. Um, find concerns and also phrase your concerns in ways that are, are relevant to 
to people who would build or to, to people who would support these projects and yeah. No, I think there's a certain modesty that's called for, you know, in the history, uh, in the face of the, some of the histories that we're looking at, or some of the economic practices and so on, is that um, there's something about, you know, like Ilza was saying earlier, it's just listening, what, what happened, what did somebody do, and so on, and just stating that as something that was done, you know, um, and then the negotiation on our side is a far lesser one, because you establish the idea in your society um, and you can then work from it you know um, and it's a you know we also work in a context where 80 85 percent of our cities are built for citizens themselves not built by architects at all so in a context where citizenry are the dominant authors of the city structure you have to have a modesty to understand what's the will of people in shaping the city you know, like the, the statement of Denise Scott Brown, where she said people are voting with their feet, they're voting with their bodies and their houses and their everything. It's like, what kind of a city do they think they should have? Or what's the one that they can negotiate relative to the forces of life? You know, and try and be modest about that and try and extend rather than overwrite those achievements. Thank you so much again uh, for for this amazing presentation. And I, I guess I will wrap up and invite anyone who can join to our next event, which will be Wednesday evening at 6 p.m., the Platt Roundtable, where we will continue to, to explore, uh, explore these themes again. So thank you so much again, Ilsa and Heinrich. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for, Thanks for listening. Thanks for paying attention to us. <laughs>